Hi guys, welcome to the start of the next module in aircraft flight mechanics. So we've finished with aircraft performance and now we're moving on to module two, which is going to be static stability and aircraft trim. Or really, it should be aircraft trim and static stability because that's sort of the order that we look them in, but the two concepts are interrelated. So we're gonna go through them together. Let me move over onto the whiteboard, just get started so I don't give you a 15 minute YouTube introduction video. Let's just start talking. We're going through aircraft trim and static stability. Now, this is the second time I've recorded these lectures. You don't necessarily need to know everything about why I've had to re-record them. Um, part of it is down to the nomenclature in this topic. So the nomenclature specifically regarding moment coefficients can be a little confusing, but it's inconsistent between different textbooks. So I'd originally started using a definition that I'd, uh, was from one textbook, and I've noticed that it's not consistent between texts, and I would just rather re-record these with consistent nomenclature throughout. But what I want to tell you this for is such that you guys can be aware of that. So if you look at a textbook, you've got to be really bloody careful about what's in the divisor of your moment coefficients and just pay attention to whether it's uppercase or lowercase letters. Okay, so in performance, or say in the performance analysis, so all of the work that we've done so far, we were looking at steady flight. We look at steady flight and to enable us to determine relationships between the aerodynamic parameters of lift and drag, uh, the propulsive one thrust, and then also the weight, the inertial force, we use the equilibrium steady flight condition, which for us was the sum of forces acting on the aircraft was equal to zero. So this was our equilibrium steady flight condition. Okay. So I shouldn't use SFC really, because SFC is specific fuel consumption, but in this sense, this is steady flight condition. I'm being a little bit lazy there with writing things down. So this, like I say, enabled us to look at relationships between aerodynamic parameters and weight and thrust. And then we were able to look at things like the interchange of kinetic energy and potential energy to look beyond uh, level flights to then start looking at climbing and falling, climb or climbing and uh, sinking rather. So inherent in this condition was another one that we didn't explicitly mention. And the, if we have zero forces acting on the aircraft and we are flying along steady flights, we are at a steady, out, a steady attitude, attitude being the orientation of the aircraft in 3D space. So in order for that to happen, the sum of the moments acting on the aircraft had to also be zero. So we'll say that inherent, but not explicitly stated, We'll say that also the sum of the moments at any time acting on the aircraft has to be equal to zero. So this defines a, another set of parameters that we can look at, and this defines the trim state of the aircraft. We have to be a little bit careful with the word trim in aircraft flight mechanics, or certainly just in aerospace engineering because trim has a few different meanings. Trim means for our purposes that the aircraft has a zero net moment. So it has no angular, uh, it has no angular velocity. And this one here, the omega vector, this is our angular rotation vector, which we will learn is P, Q and R. Okay, well, just, I'm just saying that, that we have no angular rotation because the sum of moments is zero. P 
pilots will tend to think of a trim as being a condition whereby there's no stick force required. And unfortunately, we won't get enough time to look into trim tabs in this course. But what, what this really means is that uh, we're going to look at the different, control, the different control surfaces on an aircraft. So say if we've got our horizontal tail, we've got the elevator at the end of it, there might be a trim tab at the very end here. So this is horizontal tail. This is the elevator. And this is the trim tab. So longitudinal motion of the stick or the yoke adjusts this one. So it changes the elevator deflection in this axis. And then the pilot finds that they want to trim the aircraft to a certain condition. So this is giving them a, a, a new pitch. Um, oh, I've lost my elevator on this aircraft, bugger. Uh, okay, so we'll find that if the pilot wants to stay at a certain condition, they've got to maintain a certain stick force, for example, to maintain that attitude. Then what they can do is adjust this trim tab to find a position of equilibrium on the entire control system. Oh, sorry, the entire control force. Um, so we're not going to look at that in this course, but just be aware that a pilot will tend to think about trim as being the state where the forces are zero on the, on the actual stick itself. So they've adjusted the trim tab. So in this module, we're going to look at this trim state. So we're looking along the three principal axes of our aircraft and we are, which is X, Y, and Z. And we're going to look at how we can make sure the aircraft is trimmed in each of those. And once we've got this concept of trim, we're then going to look at stability. So stability, is firstly stability is this idea that how if if the aircraft is in a given trim state if it's disturbed does it tend to want to go back to that initial trim state so we say if the aircraft is disturbed from trim does it return And we're going to look at that both in the short term, which we call static stability, and then the long term, which is dynamic stability. But we're not going to touch the dynamic stuff till about module four and five. So that's this first idea of stability. Because of that, what stability also dictates is how difficult an aircraft is to manoeuvre. So if, if the aircraft wants to return back to this trim state, then it's quite difficult to perturb it if we want to. So we can appreciate that in steady level flights, Aircraft's flying along. If you want to move into a new, if you want to, to say initiate a turn, if the aircraft is hard to maneuver, i.e. it's very, very stable, then it is going to be more difficult to affect that turn. Okay, so to look at these concepts in detail, we need to introduce uh, different axes sets. So we're going to define aircraft body axes and we're going to define the forces and moments within. And we're also going to look at the aerodynamic angles alpha and beta. Now in module three, when we develop the aircraft equations of motion, we're going to look at more axes sets in general. We have body axes, which are the ones we're looking at next. We've got the earth axes, 
and we've got stability and wind axes. But in this present module, we're just going to give it the introduction to body axes or aircraft, aircraft axes. So we'll work in aircraft body axes. Um, these are the ones that we end up using to resolve, new, sorry, to express Newton's second law for the third module as well. So it's a good axis set to get the hang of at this early stage. So let's draw an aircraft. I'm still not very good at drawing aircraft despite how long I've been an aerospace engineer for. So I'm not just going to draw the axes here, I'm also going to draw some of the nomenclature that hopefully you guys know already, but we're going to flesh it out a little bit more. So aircraft axes is a right-handed Cartesian axis set. Now for the purpose of this, I always have my camera flipped around so I can, when I look in the screen, it makes sense to me. Um, I see the mirrored image of myself, which I'm expecting. But for describing axis sets, that gets confusing because I'm going to use my right hand a lot and you guys want to maybe use your right hands as well. So aircraft axes is a right-handed triad. Okay, right-handed axis set is index is X, middle finger is Y, thumb is Z. And the X points through the nose of the aircraft. The origin is at the aircraft center of gravity. So aircraft CG. That's probably a little bit too far forward. I've just drawn that and we're gonna talk more about that later. Let's put the aircraft CG here. So aircraft X sticks out through the nose. And we're gonna just give these directions. We'll use lowercase Roman letters for the directions of X, Y, and Z. Y is positive along the starboard wing. And Z is positive down. Okay, so Y is positive in the span-wise ordinate of the wing, not including sweep. Okay, so it's, a, it's the direction that is normal to the aircraft longitudinal axes. So we'll just say in black are our directions. I'm then gonna draw uh, some forces on here. Now we don't really deal with forces in so much in the static stability module, but it's good to get them written down now. So forces, we have uppercase X, uppercase Y, and uppercase Z, those are our forces. We've also got translational, uh, or sorry, or linear, linear, linear motions, linear velocities. So we'll say linear velocities. These are U, uppercase U, uppercase V, and uppercase W. It's a shame, I don't like having to write uppercase letters, but it becomes very important when we want to linearize these equations later that these are uppercase. So we've got linear velocities um, and then we're also going to put rotations in this axis frame. So we deal with moments and angular rotations. So let's draw the moments in yellow. Let's just check this pen shows up. Yeah that does, that's good. So the moments are all right-handed so Stick your thumb along the axis and the direction your fingertips curl around it is the direction of a positive moment. Okay, so it's hard to draw these arrows unambiguously, but we've got the positive moments. Let's just write these down, L, M, and N. So L, M, and N. And we can just write the direction of these positive rotations down because these are then gonna be the direction of positive not just the moments, but also then the angular rates and the angular displacements. So the directions for positive moments in each of these is going to be port wing down for roll. Um, it's going to be nose up 
And then it's going to be nose, nose starboard. Okay, so if you're not happy with that, get yourself a little aircraft model, X, Y, Z, think thumbs going forward, that's my X axis, I wrap my fingers around that, that means my port wing goes down. I've messed up here, I've messed up, okay? I can see that, there should be starboard wing down, Jesus. Starboard wing down, and this is how, <laughs> it's important that I make mistakes sometimes and how I recognize them, so X here, X axis going forward, my thumb is sticking on it, fingertips curl round, has to be starboard wing down, okay? Nose up, thumb across the Y axis, fingertips curl round, nose up, and no starboard, thumb down, fingertips curl round, gonna be nose going starboard, okay? And if you're confused on which one's port and starboard, starboard's got two R's in it. Okay, so those are our moments. Let's draw on our angular velocities. Okay, our angular velocities are P, Q, and R. R. P, Q, and R on there. Um, let me just check back to my diagram and see if there's anything, what else I need to put on here. Yep, angular displacements we need as well. So these are the, what it, we'll end up calling the Euler angles. These are the angles that define the aircraft's orientation with respect to the Earth i.e. its attitude. So let's find a new colour. Let's do these on in purple. So we'll say attitude or Euler angles. And these are given the symbol phi, theta and psi corresponding to x, y and z. So we've got phi, theta and psi. Okay, just remember these Greek letters, phi, theta, and psi there. I didn't mean to draw psi uppercase, but it's how I've drawn it now, or how I, sorry, how I've written the uppercase P there is unnecessary. Okay, we can describe each of these motions as well. So let's describe them. Let's find a new pen if I've got one. Slightly dark green. I'll just write these on here. We've got roll, pitch, and yaw. And I think that's everything I need on here. So yeah, I've got my velocities, U, V, and W. I've got my moments, L, M, and N. Angular rates, P, Q, and R. And I've got my angular displacements, phi, theta, and psi. So we're going to work a lot with these moments. We're going to use coefficients based upon these moments. They are going to be CM, C, sorry, CL, CM, and CN. So these moments, the coefficients that we make. So the divisor that we use on each of these has to have the form of a moment in there. So it becomes a half row b squared s and then some l some length needs to be added into each of these so let's write them down the three moments are l m and n which are rolling pitching and yawing moments so c subscript with a lowercase l is l divided by half row b squared s and then for the rolling moment the characteristic length is b which is the span Wingspan for CM, we have M divided by half rho B squared S, and then it's got C bar, the mean aerodynamic chord. And then CN is C subscript N, N divided by half rho B squared S, B. And again, B is the span. Now, this is the bit that is often very inconsistent between different texts, depending who you're looking at. Um, we can see this is gonna cause a bit of confusion because CL, so we use C subscript L, rolling moment coefficients. But we've got uppercase L is rolling moments. 
Now, the reason why we make the switch from uppercase to lowercase is to avoid confusing with CL, which is the lift coefficient. But then you might ask, well, I know actually that CL, let's try and draw this slightly differently. CL with a subscript L is also the 2D lift coefficient. So how on earth do we tell the difference between this and this? Well, it's context. Okay, unfortunately it's context. You'll often see in the divisor, um, the, well, if you, if you have access to the divisor, you can see what the dimensions of the original uh, moment or force was, but it's context. If you're doing it by hand, I try and draw this L slightly more curly. That was advice given to me by my um, PhD supervisor, but unfortunately it just comes down to context here. Some texts will put the CL subscript and then they'll leave CM and CN as uppercase and I don't like that because it's inconsistent. I like these to be consistently lowercase. Some texts have them all lowercase. Some texts have something really confusing. Some texts you might see CL um, MA, which is the rolling moments, which is what we know. And then it's saying that it's a moment and that it's aerodynamic here. So these are, that's confusing. We, we're not gonna use that, but just be aware that these are different between different textbooks. So you just be careful of what you're using and where it comes from. Um, those are almost everything we've got on here. Let's just draw a couple more things. We've got a pro, our control surfaces on here. So let's highlight our control surfaces. We've got the ailerons, which provide roll control. We've got the elevator which provides pitch control and we've got the rudder so let's draw our displacements for each of these so we do small delta subscript a for the ailerons small delta subscript e for the elevator small delta subscript r for the rudder i like this uh, this definition of those so let's write these on here um a this is aileron, elevator, and rudder deflections. Now, in some older textbooks, this this one that we just I've just put up here is a principally American sign convention. I prefer this to what you see in older textbooks a lot from Europe, which is zeta, eta. Sorry, it's not zeta. That's c eta and zeta so c eta and zeta now we are not going to use this but i just want you guys to be aware of that you might see it sometimes in textbooks that's very confusing because i can't draw zeta and c distinctly reliably um and they just end up looking like squiggles on the page. And it's not very easy to think which one is which in terms of those orders, because they're not in alphabetical order. Um, whereas it's easy to see that A, E and R stand for aileron, elevator and rudder. Okay, so that's our parts on here. Now we're just gonna talk a little bit about each of these. So uh, let's write over here, so ailerons. Provide a roll rate. Elevators provide a pitch attitude, or elevator gives a pitch attitude. And the rudder gives us a side slip. And again, you can think about this being an attitude. Um, it's not the same as psi, but what I'm trying to say there is if you deflect the ailerons, the aircraft starts turning in roll and it will keep turning in roll because what the ailerons provide is a roll rate, whereas the other two, the elevator provides a change in the moment which causes the aircraft to trim at a new angle of attack. Um, and then the rudder provides a side slip, so it provides a constant offset to the flight speed vector and the aircraft. So that's our model that we're going to use for our, our aircraft. And these are the moment coefficients that we're going to use for this course. So that's the model set up. Before we proceed, we're going to go through a little bit of a revision of 2D aerofoil theory.
because we're going to use the definition of the aerodynamic center to help us out. So let's just draw an arbitrary aerofoil with some velocity on it. That's some angle of attack. So I'm not trying to draw a super accurate pressure or a super perfect pressure distribution. I'm just trying to draw some pressure distribution on my aerofoil such that it's producing lift. All right, let's, yeah, let's draw them that way, okay. Doesn't really matter on here. And then we've got some ordinates span-wise, which we call X. So let's just do a, a reminder of what the difference between the center of pressure and the aerodynamic center is. So XCP is the longitudinal position that you could draw some resultant force and that resultant force would give the correct lift and drag or the fact that it would give the same force as the integrated pressure on both sides and the same moment. should say where a single resultant force gives the same force and moments as integrated pressure distribution. So this is going back, channeling MMA 312. Okay, so that's our XCP. Now for a symmetric aerofoil, subsonic, before stall, XCP is the quarter chord for, like I say, for before stall and for subsonic conditions. Let's just put in here symmetric M upper M well subsonic and alpha less than alpha stall. Okay, so that's where the center of pressure lives. Now for a, for a cambered aerofoil, the center of pressure is then a, a function of the angle of attack. So at high angles of attack, the center of pressure is pretty close to the quarter core position. So high alpha, XCP will say is approximately quarter chord as alpha tends towards, well let's actually say when CL tends towards zero, XCP tends towards infinity. And the reason for that is that we can realize that when we've got our, if we have our, sorry, cambered aerofoil, cambered aerofoil, at producing no lift will still produce a nose down pitching moment. So there has to be some force that has zero value, but can also produce a nose down pitching moment. So the only way that we can have that is if the center of pressure tends towards infinity as the, as the CL is actually close to zero. So this isn't particularly useful for us in flight mechanics because what we want to be able to do is work out how the forces on different aerodynamic surfaces relate to the center of gravity. So it's not useful for us to have to use the center of pressure. So we use the aerodynamic center instead. So let's say XAC. This is the position on the aerofoil where the moment doesn't change with the angle of attack. And if the moment doesn't change with the angle of attack, then the way that we can represent the aerofoil is that if we have a cambered aerofoil with some pressure distribution, we can represent this as being equal to some resultant force and some 
moment that's this constant offset and then if this is this is fine to use because we can then say that the lift even when the lift is zero we've got this constant moment offset so this is zero lift moment and this position here this is the aerodynamic center okay So the aerodynamic center is super useful for us and we're gonna use it in flight mechanics because it helps us to define where we're gonna load our aircraft and where we're going to put those forces on. So if you are, um, if you're a little bit rusty on those, go back and look at those 312 notes, drop a note on Slack and we, we can talk it, we can talk about it more, okay? So before we move on, I just want to show you something on the accompanying notes. So remember, go to aircraftflightmechanics.com. There is the static stability section, which is being reconstructed as we speak, but we've got on here, we've got a, an interactive diagram uh, for the aircraft body axes. So you can zoom in, move around, you can think, okay, well, I can uncheck all of the annotations on here. I can double click on one and I just maybe have the moments, for example. And if you're uncertain, you can zoom in, zoom out. Oh, nothing ever works when I drive when I want it to. Um, you can see I've got my moments L, M and N, and it's got the direction in terms of arrows, which way they go on there. So play around with this. Um, if you can name what the aircraft is and write in the comments, that'd be great. Um, and there's another one down here for the aerodynamic angles, which we'll talk about next. So in fact, let's, yeah, let's talk about the aerodynamic angles now. It's not where I was gonna go with this, but let's talk about those. So the aerodynamic angles are the relationship between the velocity vector, the aircraft velocity vector, and body axes. So the velocity vector is Vf and body axes is the axes that we've just defined. Now, the way that the aerodynamic angles relate these two axes sets together is that the velocity vector is defined in wind axes. Okay, so defined in wind axes, now if we, now's a good chance to look here actually. I haven't got the relationship between wind axes shown, but I've got the diagram of the velocity vector shown on here. So let me just zoom in on here a bit. Let's make, yeah, that's bigger, that's better. So this is a Harrier, uh, some angle of attack and side slip. Now what we have, then, I don't know, my trackpad's not working very well, but we've got the velocity vector is the red arrow not related, which is actually what the previous aircraft was, is one of the red arrows, but um, I mean the literal red arrow on here is the velocity vector, and it's rotated through two axes, two angles to get to the aircraft body axes. So if we think about the velocity vector is the x direction of wind axes, and then we rotate it first through side slip, which takes us into an intermediate axis set called stability axes, which we'll cover more next module, and then through the angle of attack into aircraft body axes. So play around with this diagram just so you can see how those angles work. And we're gonna talk about those angles just here now, okay? So wind axes, the velocity vector, and this is the U of the wind axis set, okay? So U, W means it's the U of the wind axis set. We then take through beta, which is the side slip angle, and this takes to stability axes. Stability axes are aligned with the aircraft horizontal plane. So they are in this plane here, okay, plane there. And um, that's 
just whilst I'm here, it's why I never say plane for aircraft because we, by plane we mean a some a big flat surface. So if I, if I was to cut the aircraft down this center line and put a big sheet down here, this would be the stability plane. So the velocity, once it's been rotated through the sides of angle, is then in stability axes. And this is where we can look at the aircraft in a two-dimensional diagram and see the velocity approaching at the angle of attack. We then, let's write these here. So I then have the velocity vector. I've got us and vs. And this bit is gonna be a little bit um, maybe over your head at the moment and we're gonna, it'll make more sense once we've done module three, but I want the detail here just so you guys can appreciate what we're looking at. And we then rotate through the angle of attack to go into body axes. Okay, and once we've got into body axes, we then have a U, a V, and a W. I should have had a WS in here as well. Okay, I should have put a WS there, excuse me. So when there's no subscript below these, we know we're in body axes. There isn't a subscript B for body axes. Um, but we've got these two these two aerodynamic angles, and the reason why their order is important is because it helps us define how these orientations actually work. So if we were to plot the first rotation, which is from aircraft, um, it's from velocity from the wind vector to stability axes. Then if I drew my XS and let's draw that lowercase x, we'll say XS and YS. Those are actually aligned in the direction that we're looking them with aircraft body as well. So I've got X and Y there. VF is my velocity vector and this is through the side slip angle. So what we end up turning them into, we can get the aircraft, um, we can, the bit that we want is this direction here. This is VF cosine beta. And this here gives us the aircraft V, which is VF sine beta. We've done our first velocity component in body axes. And we then can look at the angle of attack. So the angle of attack is we've got aircraft X, aircraft Z, and we've got our velocity vector, VF. We've also got in here, I could draw on the stability axes. So stability axes would be XS, ZS, and that angle there. The angle of attack is here, and I should have written VF cosine beta there, rather, VF cosine beta. So then I can get my two velocity components. I've got U, which is the aircraft X velocity. U is equal to VF cosine beta cosine alpha, and then W. W is equal to VF cosine beta, sine alpha, okay? We're gonna do these transformations in more detail when we get to module three, but I just want you guys to have the correct definition of these angles written down now. So we can say here that the aircraft, three components of velocity, U, V, and W, are equal to VF, the magnitude of the flight speed vector, multiplied by cosine alpha, cosine beta, sine beta, cosine beta, sine alpha. Okay, so those are the definitions of our aerodynamic angles. Now this just requires you to draw these diagrams out. If you get confused about the direction of these positive angles, then there's a way that I remember what the positive direction of alpha and beta are. So the way that I remember is, let's do beta first. So I know that beta is the relationship between, I'll just draw the aircraft X and Y. 
my flight speed vector is always drawn between the axes. I, I draw it up in that direction. I don't draw my flight speed vector there. Okay, so my flight speed vector is always between my two axes sets. So this is my positive beta. Okay, so positive beta means that I've got my aircraft now with the inclement velocity approaching from the starboard side. So the aircraft motion that would give us a positive side slip is starting with the aircraft velocity vector facing it. And the motion would be, the camera is reversed. Let me switch the camera around. Okay, so aircraft velocity vector approaching it. And then the motion that would give it the wind vector approaching from the starboard side would be aircraft nose port. So that's the aircraft motion that gives us positive side slip. Okay, and so we can do a similar diagram with the aircraft angle of attack. So we've got our X and our Z axes. Okay, but again, we remember that the aircraft velocity vector is drawn between the two, i.e. we don't draw our out we don't draw it up in this direction so our positive angle of attack is very similarly defined as approaching the aircraft from between the x and z and then that means that our aircraft motion that gives us a positive angle of attack is a nose up motion okay so that's our aerodynamic angles and we're going to use those in conjunction with the moments and the rates that we've determined to build up a stability relationship for, let's say, build up with both the trim and stability relationships um, in terms of what we call the aircraft stability derivatives. So we'll use the moment definitions. and the rates and aerodynamic angles and control surface deflections to right stability relationships I've written stability, I put too many LIs in there. Right, stability relationships. In terms of stability derivatives. Now stability derivatives we're gonna use in the remaining modules of this course. These are effectively the data that underpin how aircraft want to fly. Stability derivatives are what I spent a lot of my working life in a wind tunnel getting for different airframes. Um, they are the soul of the aircraft, the how the aircraft respond in one axis due to motions in that axis, but also due to moments in other axes. So we'll separate these down into roll, pitch, and yaw, and we'll look at them separately. So we say in rolling motion, we'll say that our rolling moments in coefficient form is equal to some zero offsets. So this is a constant term, CL zero. So that's C, it's got a subscript L, and the L's got a subscript zero. Plus, and now's our first stability derivative, We'll say it's C L P multiplied by P. So let's just have a look at what C L P means. So this is C subscript L subscript P. And what this means is the partial derivative of the rolling moment coefficient with respect to the roll rate. So it's partial derivative of rolling moments, COF, with respect to roll rate. Okay, and then we've got one more on here that we'll put, we'll put 
the control derivative. So CL, the control that we're going to include in our role model is the aileron. So CL delta A delta A. So that's the aileron deflection. Now, if we were to write this out fully, and as we'll see when we write them out for the full nonlinear aircraft equations of motion, we have a bunch of other cross coupling terms. We're not going to really use those too much in this, this module, other than looking at the very basic uh, role and your cross coupling and only then in terms of qualitative terms. But I'm going to want you guys to be able to look at these derivatives, understand what they mean just by this sort of nomenclature here, and then think about what aircraft design parameters they are proportional to or what influences them. So that's our role model in this derivative form. We're going to do the same for pitch. So pitch is C with the subscript M, which is a lowercase m, so I just drew a little bit better of a tail. Cm is equal to Cm naught plus Cm alpha multiplied by alpha plus Cm q multiplied by q plus Cm dA dA, so that's the aileron control rate der derivative. So we've got here, this is angle of attack. This is pitch rate. And then this is aileron. So we actually have an, an aerodynamic derivative here and we didn't have one for roll. So there's no CM, oh sorry, there's no CL and then some aerodynamic roll term. And that's fundamentally because there isn't an aerodynamic um, angle for roll. The aircraft will fly exactly the same, um, excluding gravity terms, whether it's this way up or whether it's that way up. Okay, the aircraft, obviously the relationship between lift and weight is going to change, but the wings don't care effectively whether the wind vector has been turned around or not. Okay, so of these here, we're going to spend our time fundamentally investigating this CM alpha term. So it's CM alpha and by extension DCM on DCL and those hopefully you guys can see those are proportional. These are these underpin what we call longitudinal static stability. And we're going to look in great detail at these. We're going to derive models for these. We're going to work out fundamentally how can we move our center of gravity within our aircraft and maintain the stability um, criteria for this model here. So that's this one looked at. This is the rate of change of the pitching moment coefficient with pitch rate. So this we're going to look at this as well. We'll just talk about this one qualitatively and what's going to influence it. This one's a control derivative. The one that I haven't mentioned is this term here, and it's the same CM0 and CL0 here. Okay, and we're going to do a similar one in terms of your as well. These are just constants. So what these do is these influence the trim state. They, they influence effectively how the aircraft, so CM0 is going to influence the angle the aircraft trims at. It doesn't influence stability. Okay, so that's our pitch one. And let's just do the last one, which is your. So this is C with a subscript N is equal to CN naught plus CN beta multiplied by beta plus CN R multiplied by R, which is the your rate. And you can see me in my head, I'm having to count through them then. I think I know it's roll pitch your, so it's PQR, yeah, so it's R, I had to think about it. And then we've got the last one here is the control rate derivative, which is CM delta R, delta R. Again, so we've got a constant term here. We've got side slip, your rate, and rudder here. Okay, so, we're going to 
look at this one, CM beta, and compare it to CM alpha here. CM beta and CM alpha, those are respectively what we're going to refer to as the stiffnesses of the system. So these are pitch and your stiffness. And we can think of them about them as a stiffness because effectively these are a measure of if we have a disturbance, then how much does it want to return? So these are a, a restorative moment that's just proportional to a displacement. And then these other terms here, which we've got um, CLP, CMQ, and CNR. Let's draw all over this diagram. These are our roll, pitch, and your damping. And these are restorative moments that are a function not of displacement, but instead of angular rates. So because they're proportional to rates, these then are a, a damping. And you guys should be aware from sort of systems analysis courses before that if we've got a mass spring damper system, spring has the symbol K, C has the symbol C. The spring restorative force is a function of X. So we'll say that's FK is a function of the displacement. And then the force that it gives you a restorative force from the, from the damper, FC, is a function of the first derivative or the velocity of the displacement. So that's why we use these terms stiffness and damping and that's why you look at systems like this because it helps us understand and analyze more complicated things like aircraft models. So we've gone through those, gone through the angles. Um, just before we wrap up today, I'm gonna to talk about system stability and then we're gonna think about the sign that we would expect some of these to have. So, Let's talk about stability and what it is. So stability, um, we've defined trim as being a condition where the aircraft is in uh, a state where there are zero moments acting on it. So there therefore are not any, any uh, angular rates occurring. Stability is whether the aircraft is disturbed. So if, if this is my trim state, if the aircraft is disturbed in pitch, does it tend to go back to that initial trim state or not? If it's disturbed instead in your, does it tend to go back to that initial state? And the same with roll as well. So the way that we describe this, we break it down into static and dynamic stability. Static stability is the initial response. And we'll say this is the tendency to return. And then dynamic stability is long term or, or longer term. And we'll say whether the system actually does return or not. And when I put returned, what do you mean there? That's returning to trim. And this is assuming that our disturbance is a disturbance away from some trim states. So, you know, whether these actually mean anything or not, let's, let's think about what they mean for our aircraft. So if our aircraft has a trim state where it's got zero pitch and we'll say it's some zero angle of attack as well. Then if it's disturbed in pitch, positive static stability means that the aircraft immediately returns, okay? Or it effectively it means that the restorative moment is nose down. So when it pitches up, it has a tendency to pitch down. 
Same with side slip. If the aircraft is disturbed in side slip, it has a tendency to go back. The dynamic stability are the long-term parts of this. So imagine if our aircraft pitches up by 10 degrees and then it has a tendency to return, but it pitches down by a full 25 degrees. It then will have this tendency again to return, but it goes up to positive 25 degrees, pitches back down, pitches back up, and this is then an increasing oscillation. So dynamic stability, even though we, can, we have this idea of static stability, we can have static stability and the dynamic behavior can be very different. So let's draw a quick diagram for static stability. We will imagine this as three balls on three surfaces. So one surface like this with a ball on top, second surface like this with a ball on top and a third surface like this with a ball on top. So this first one, if the ball is disturbed in any direction, its initial tendency will be to accelerate away. This is what we call unstable. This is just statically unstable. The, the immediate tendency is for the ball to go elsewhere. With this one, this the ball, if it's disturbed in either sense, will, will find a new equilibrium state. So this is neutral. Okay, doesn't have a tendency to either increase or decrease in terms of its uh, trim state, it just will go to and find a new one. This one here, the ball will have a tendency to go up and come back in each case. So this is stable. Okay, so that's our idea of, of static stability. Dynamic stability takes into account all of these behaviors above, which is this static case. And we can only have, we can only have dynamic stability if we have static stability. So we'll say that static stability is necessary but not sufficient for system stability because the total system stability is governed by its dynamic stability and we can look at what that looks like for three different cases. So first off, we'll look at a system that has static behavior and it's, it's got a dynamic, dynamically stable response. So we'll look at the aircraft angle of attack versus time. So time divided by seconds, angle of attack, I'm not going to put any units on here. This is our trim condition in the middle. Let's say at time zero, the aircraft has been disturbed up to some angle of attack. So with positive static stability, the tendency will be to return to zero. It might overshoot, that's fine, but then it will have a tendency to continue until we reach, after enough time, a settling time that is back to this original equilibrium position. So we'll say it returns after time to alpha t. This is dynamically stable. And what we'd see and we're going to look at more in module five is that this is bounded by an exponential decay curve. And again, we're gonna look at that more in module five. I just want you guys to be aware of these different responses the aircraft can have. So we can have a, a, an aircraft that's, again, we've got alpha trim and we're then disturbed. I'm not gonna draw the rest of the angles on here. The aircraft can have this tendency to return, but we've got oscillations of continual height. This would be dynamically neutral. We won't often find this with aircraft because it's just on the cusp between positive and negative stability. The case for the next, so that's our trim state. So let's say we've been disturbed. The aircraft can have this tendency, let's draw that a little bit lower. Let's say the aircraft has a tendency to return, but it overshoots and then it's increasing oscillation. So we've got exponential increase here. This is dynamically unstable. And this was the case where I showed a moment ago 
with the aircraft that pitches up, but it, has, it will go back, but it goes and it overshoots and it keeps oscillating in this violent oscillations. That would be an unstable pitch mode and that's very, very dangerous for an aircraft. Um, so you could draw one of these with static um, with static instability. Let's draw that. So let's say here, this is time, trim state up here. If the aircraft has been disturbed up to this alpha one position, which is our, our disturbance, the static behavior is just that it has this tendency to immediately move away. Okay, we could have dynamic behavior on top of this, but it doesn't matter because the whole system can never be stable if it's statically unstable. Systems statically unstable, whereas all three of these are statically stable. So this guy should give you guys some indication of, of what we're looking at in terms of stability. It's whether the system returns back to where it was before the disturbance occurred. Now, we're going to look at the long-term dynamic stability in later modules, but we can use these ideas to help us build up this basic, these basic concepts of aircraft static stability because they help us understand fundamentally how far back can we put cargo in the aircraft. So we're going to intuit some things about the pitch and the yaw stiffness, CM alpha and CN beta, and we're going to think about what makes them stable. And this is one of those very annoying choices that someone made in aerodynamics um, back when they were developing the aircraft body axes, much like for some godforsaken reason, they chose rolling moments. They chose the moments to start at L. So we have CL and CL meaning two different things, whereas they could have chosen moments to be M, N and O, for example, and then that would be much less confusing. Um, similarly, the sign convention for alpha and beta means that the stability criteria for these two derivatives is different, but we can think about them and we'll be logical and then it will help you always remember the, the definition of these. So let's look at the two. What's gonna make CM alpha and CN beta stable? So let's look at the first one. This is pitch stiffness. Pitch stiffness is related to the angle of attack and the pitching moment. So a positive pitching moment is nose up and a positive angle of attack is also nose up. So let's consider our aircraft at zero angle of attack. Uh, for some reason, I'm almost drawing a car there. Okay, terrible aircraft, but it's here now. Let's say this is our aircraft at some trim states. Let's say it's at alpha trim. Um, and this is at T is equal to zero. So, our aircraft is flying along in a trim state and it's got sum of moments as a consequence are equal to zero. So the pitching moment is equal to zero. If the aircraft is disturbed and it goes to a positive angle of attack, let's say, can I turn this? Yep. So we'll say alpha disturbance. And I'm gonna be clear, this is a positive angle of attack the disturbance has now occurred at. If we want the aircraft to return, remembering that the moments are positive nose up, we need to have a nose down moment to return us. So we need a nose down brackets or negative moment for stability. So that means that our rate of change of the pitching moment with the angle of attack has to be negative in order for static stability. So D, CM on D alpha, which is equal to CM alpha, has got to be less than zero for stability.
Okay, and that's just the condition that gives us, if the aircraft pitches up, it pitches back down again. Okay, and we can think about those sign conventions. Positive pitch up is a nose up moment. And that's positive, and we want to have a negative moment to restore that. So it's got to be DCM by D alpha has to be negative. That's our stability criteria for static stability in pitch. CN beta, let's look at that. CN beta, let's draw our aircraft from the top. Um, okay, that's a terrible aircraft, but I've just drawn it. So we've got our aircraft X and Y. And at time zero, aircraft flight speed vector, aircraft flight speed vector is sticking out the front of the aircraft, going straight ahead. And then we have a positive, um, positive motion or a positive change to our side slip. So let's call this VF prime. Remembering we draw the wind vector in between X and Y axes. That's what defines our positive beta. Now that motion of the aircraft, the aircraft has moved nose port. So whatever causes this change to beta, be it a cross gust that has changed the side slip angle, or be it um, pilots kick the rudder, for example, and it, it's moved the aircraft into a into a new um, side slip angle. Whatever happened, the aircraft has moved with respect to the to the new wind vector. It's moved nose port. Now, in order to get back aligned with this wind vector here, the one that I've just butchered. In order to get back aligned with this wind vector, the aircraft needs to move nose starboard now. Okay, so nose starboard would be a positive moment, remembering that x, sorry, the z-axis is positive down, so our positive n moment is looking at that clockwise from above. So we want, when we've got a positive side slip, we want to have a positive restorative moment. So d, c, n by d, Beta has got to be, well, it's equal to C N beta. This has got to be greater than zero, or it's got to be positive for stability. So this is the condition for positive your static stability. Now that is confusing because these two conditions are different. CN alpha has got to be less than zero. CN alpha has got to be positive, sorry, CN alpha, pitch stability has got to be negative. CN beta, your stability has got to be positive. So these two have different sign conventions, which can be confusing. can be confusing, but the reason why I go through this part, I like to go through these parts without any notes ahead of me. So I can sort of just do as much of this as I can uh, from memory like an old lecturer. Um, but it's mainly because I think it's important to show you that you can logic your way through this just from the definition of aircraft body axes and knowing that you remember that the angle of attack has got to be between the X and Z and the angle of side slip has got to be between the X and Y. And with those definitions in mind, with the right hand screw rule giving you a positive moment, you can then remember the sign convention of both of those. Okay, so you're not gonna get confused. You've then got the sign conventions for both your pitch and your your stability. So now we've got those sign conventions, let's think about what's gonna make them happen. Let's think about what makes those happen in terms of the aircraft design parameters. So we'll say that even though CN alpha and CN beta have different sign conventions, the same aerodynamic characteristics and the relationship between aerodynamic center 
and center of gravity causes both of these stability criteria to occur. And in each of these cases, it's just the longitudinal position of the aerodynamic center with respect to the center of gravity. Okay, let's think about why this occurs. So the whole aircraft aerodynamic center is gonna be the combined aerodynamic center of the wing and of the horizontal tail. In terms of the sideways um, motion, it's gonna be looking at the side force that's produced. So we're looking at the aerodynamic, the longitudinal aerodynamic center of the aircraft. So it's really a function of the vertical tail, vertical stabilizer, but also the whole body itself, okay? Because the whole body produces some form of side force whenever we've got a, a, um, a non-zero side slip. So we've got two choices for this. The aerodynamic center can be ahead of the center of gravity or the aerodynamic center can be behind the center of gravity. So it doesn't really matter about what's producing it. We'll just think about where it can be. So I'll just draw a quick schematic and we will see if we can intuit some things. So I've got my longitudinal axis. I'm gonna draw my center of gravity in the center of it. Center of gravity is important because the aircraft wants to pitch about the center of gravity. So I'll draw on here, I'll draw my pitching moment coefficient, CM. And in blue, I'm gonna draw my aerodynamic center ahead. So we'll call this CL. And in green, I'm going to draw the condition where I have my aerodynamic center aft, CL. So we'll say this is AC aft of CG. And this one is AC ahead of CG. Okay. So the distances here, we're going to call E. E is just the longitudinal distance that's been non-dimensionalized by the mean aerodynamic chord. So we'll call this longitudinal non-dimensional distance. In brackets, I'll put the mean aerodynamic chord is the, and the reason I put C bar in there is because that's the divisor that we've used in here. Okay. Uh, just to make that really clear, I'll say this is equal to L divided by C bar. So let's think about the moment that's produced by the blue one. Let's think about what happens if we have an increase in angle of attack. Um, well, let's, no, let's just put angle of attack on here in general. We'll say alpha, alpha is the same in both cases. Then the moments resolves in the center. Let's draw this for the left-hand case. We'll say CM is equal to CM naught, which is the lift independent pitching moment, plus alpha multiplied by D CL on D alpha multiplied by E. So CM alpha, which is equal to D CM on D alpha. Remember this here is just actually a constant. This is just A, which is the lift curve slope of our entire aircraft. We're going to talk more about that later in this course. If we do the derivatives of this, CM0 disappears, the alpha disappears, and then we're just left with these two terms here. So you've got A multiplied by E, which is positive, therefore unstable. This condition here, CM, the nose up pitching moment, is going to be equal to the zero left pitching moments. Now, any lift produced here that's positive is going to produce a nose down moment. So this is minus alpha, DCL on D alpha, multiplied by E. So DCM by D alpha is equal to minus AE equals negative, therefore stable. So we very quickly and sort of intuitively 
showing the condition for stability here for longitudinal pitch. So for positive pitch stiffness, let's not say pitch positive pitch stiffness actually because that's really confusing. So we'll say for stable pitch stiffness, which is C and alpha less than zero. What we've just said is that the center of gravity has to be ahead of the aerodynamic center. Okay, so we're going to be looking in our aircraft model. We're gonna build an aircraft model and we're gonna find out how to make this happen. Bearing in mind that, well, the we've got the wing and we've got the horizontal tail. So we've got to figure out the relationship of these two, which equal the aircraft lift, which is therefore equal to the aircraft weight. We've got to look at how those two go together to give us a CM alpha that's less than zero. We can also use this exact same reasoning to look at CN beta. Okay, and I'm just going to do two diagrams. I'm not going to put any sort of pseudo mathematics into it like I just did a moment ago which is going to say what happens with CN beta well there's only one surface that's got, that we're going to look at on here we'll neglect the fuselage because it does far less than the vertical stabilizer let's say the vertical stabilizer here um, can either be ahead of the CG or after the CG so we'll just draw two cases here let's draw oncoming wind and we will draw two cases one of which is with the horizontal stabilizer ahead of the CG and one of which, sorry, the vertical stabilizer, one of which is the vertical stabilizer after the CG. So remember, it doesn't even really matter for the direction of a positive moment, but we'll put here that we've got the yawing moment M. You should be able to intuit from this diagram that if you've got your longitudinal position of your center of pressure after of your CG in this case, this is stable. And the reason why hopefully you can intuit, intuit it, this comes from the name of this derivative. So CN beta, sometimes called the weathercock derivative. I don't know if you guys call it a weathercock in America. It might be the weather rooster or the weather vane, perhaps because of puritanical sensibilities. Um, but the weathercock derivative is exactly, if you've got one of those things on the top of the roof that shows you the, you the direction of the wind, the tail always orients itself after the wind. And then it's, an, it's in a stable position. It will turn into the wind always. If your tail is at the front of it, the whole aircraft would flip around and it would end up flying in that direction, okay? So this is unstable. And this is stable. So what we've shown here is that even though the sign convention for CN alpha and CN beta are different, the same condition helps us in both cases. The same physical condition helps us in both cases. And what I'm really trying to highlight here is that CN beta and CN alpha, those derivatives that we've come up with, are just human constructs to describe something that is a physical system. And in a physical system like this, your center of pressure has to be after your center of gravity or like a weathercock that you're trying to tilt into the wind, it won't be stable. And if you want another example that's gonna try and help you understand these, if you've ever played darts, try and throw a dart backwards, okay? It won't work. It will right itself and it will go point forwards, feathers behind, okay? Or 
yeah, go feathers behind. I've forgotten what you call those things on darts now. Um, okay, so that's we've gone through quite a, a, a good introduction to this. Let's do two more derivatives. Um, I want you guys to intuit these. No, we'll do three more actually. We'll do this because we've done the stiffnesses here. This is a long lecture, but it's a good one. I'm into good flow. So we've got stiffnesses. So we've looked at these stiffnesses and we've intuited some things about them. Um, stiffnesses. Remembering there isn't the equivalent of this roll stiffness because there isn't an aerodynamic angle for roll. We're now going to look at the damping. So for the stiffnesses, we found that the stability criteria is a function of the CG position and the AC position. So we are going to use a model to work out what the actual physical parameters that we use to determine this are, because it's it's gonna there's gonna be some point at which we put our CG too aft in the aircraft, and the aircraft has this tendency to flip over. For the damping, we're gonna look at how we can describe this sort of qualitatively and instructively. So we're gonna imagine both CLP, which is the Let's do them, I'll write them all down. Okay, these damping terms. Um, C, L, P, C, M, Q, and C, M, R. And I've got to think about them ahead as I go through. So this is roll, pitch, and yaw. And at the moment, we're just looking at these dampings in one direction. So we're not looking at the moment at what's what, what are called cross couplings. Cross couplings, for example, would be would be C L Q. This would be the rate of change of the roll rate with a pitch. So the rate of change of the rolling moment with pitch rate. So this is roll moment pitch rate. This would be a cross couple. We're going to talk more about those later. There's not too many of those. I expect you guys to better intuit as a um, as an aerospace engineer. I can't really think what the relationship between would be between rolling moment and pitch rate um, on a symmetric aircraft. You might have some if you've got a big engine in there, but I can't think why you'd get a CLQ term. We'll talk more about those later. So in terms of dampings, we can look at, well, we'll look at pitch and your at the same time, because we looked at pitch and your similarly before. It was this relationship between the AC and the CP. So let's look at the two conditions with the aerodynamic center with respect to the center of gravity. Okay, so I've got my center of gravity here. I'm just gonna do the pitch rates. Um, I'm going to look at the pitch and you guys can use the same methodology to extend to the yaw. Okay, so I've got two examples. I'm drawing these on as aerofoils. This is just representing the, the two aerodynamic centers. So this first one is AC ahead of CG and the second one is AC aft of CG. So we're going to apply a positive pitch rate. So we're looking at this first one. We've got a positive pitch rate, which is a nose up motion. Again, if you're doing this, and I expect you guys to show this again for the yaw rates, it's exactly the same, but it's just we're dealing with sideways velocities rather than upways velocities. So the whole aircraft longitudinal axis gets pitched upwards which means it's got this motion, okay, so this angular motion, which is gonna be Q multiplied by L, where L is just this displacement along this axis. So what this causes is if we've got this condition up here, we've got a an effective downwash on our aerodynamic center, and in this one, we've got an effective upwash on our aerodynamic center. So we've got downwash, and here we've got upwash. So let's think about what downwash does. In both these cases, we've got V infinity coming towards the aircraft. So we've got V infinity, we've got downwash here, 
what this results in is a negative angle of attack. So a negative angle of attack, which means a reduction in lift. That reduction in lift is effectively a force that works in this direction. So we'll call this DL going downwards, which produces a nose down moment. So this is restorative. So D, C, M, D, Q is restorative, which um, is negative if the AC is ahead. And let's have a look at what happens in this case over here. On the right, we've got this upwash. Then we've got an increase in angle of attack for very similar reasons. So we've got upwash, therefore an increase in angle of attack, therefore an increase in DL, which is in this case acting upwards, which is gonna again cause a nose down moment. Therefore DCM and DQ is negative and therefore restorative if the AC is aft of CG. So in both these cases we've just shown, it doesn't matter where the longitudinal position of the center of gravity is, DCM and DQ, which is equal to CMQ, is always negative, always restorative. Okay, always negative, always restorative. This is our pitch damping. And we can use a very similar, use the same diagram to swap the Q for an R and swap the M for an N. You'll show the exact same thing with your, that the your damping is always gonna be restorative. Um, in both these cases, we can also think that the damping doesn't just come from the lifting surfaces. We've also got the fuselage itself. The whole aircraft fuselage um, can be a lifting surface. So if you've got a longitudinal fuselage, which we approximate as a cylinder, um, center of gravity is here. As the aircraft pitches up, the downwash is largest at the, I've drawn this terribly, but the large wash is going to be the downwash is going to be largest at the very leading edge of the whole aircraft, and the upwash is going to be largest at the very tail of the whole aircraft. So the fuselage itself contributes to both of these damping terms. So I've drawn this as upwash, and I've spoken about this as upwash and downwash here, but they would just be sideways velocities for the uh, yaw rate. This last one, roll damping. Let's just think about where this comes from. So roll damping is the rate of change of the rolling moment due to a roll rate. So very similar, we've got the aircraft. Uh, this is an aircraft flying towards us. We best get out of the way. So a positive roll rate is going to be a P, which gives us a starboard wing down. If it's starboard wing down, that's going to induce a motion this direction and this direction, which causes a, an upwash over here, downwash over here. So this is going to cause an increase in lift and a decrease in lift. So this is then so if we draw this as lift, this is upwash, downwash. Again, this is going to provide us exactly the same thing. It's going to give us a restorative moment. It will give us a negative L. So CLP is always going to be less than zero. It's always going to be restorative. So we think about what helps us out with each of these. CLP, roll damping, comes from the wings. Okay, the wings are furthest away from central gravity, so they move the fastest when we have a roll rate. Pitch damping, it's largely going to come from the horizontal stabilizer. Okay, you'll get some occurring because of the fuselage as well. Not so much because of the wings, because they are not they're traditionally quite close to the center of gravity. And then your damping. Your damping will come primarily from the vertical stabilizer, um, but also quite a bit due to the fuselage itself and its side projection as we move in the your rate. 
So that is what I wanted to go through today. That's a good introduction to stability. We've introduced these ideas of the stability derivatives. Um, and now you should be able to take these stability deriv derivatives, think about what they represent, just remembering that we've got the aircraft axes, x, y, and z. We've got the primary moments, L, M, and N. So when we're writing those in dimensional terms, they are uppercase L, M, and N. Coefficients, they are lowercase L, M, and N, CL, CM, and CN. We've got the aerodynamic angles, alpha and beta. So alpha is a nose up pitching motion that gives the velocity approach in the aircraft from below. Beta is a nose, I'm reversed. So beta is a nose port pitching motion that causes the aircraft to approach, the velocity to approach from the um, starboard side of the aircraft. So we've got those and you can think about all of those derivatives, what they represent and just relate them back to some design parameters about different aircraft components. Okay, so we're gonna move on with the next lecture, which is looking at this, this means that we can come up with a numerical model for CM alpha, pitch stiffness. So we know CM alpha has got to be less than zero. Let's try and work out how we can actually determine that for an aircraft and put a number on it, okay? So thank you for listening. Thanks for putting up with me re-recording these lectures and I will see you all 